Hey, we're getting into a new series called Prepare, Getting Ready for God's Work. We've got to do God's work, amen? amen. It's not our work, it's God's work. And if we're going to do God's work, we've got to be prepared. Anytime you go out and do anything, uh, out in the yard, the other day I, uh, I was building something out of a pallet trying to make a mud kitchen uh, for my son uh, because we, for Christmas, got him a pile of dirt. <clears throat> we did. If you come to our house, there's about six yards of washed sand out there. And uh, so we got him a mud kitchen. It's Emerson's Mud Kitchen. If you'd like any kind of uh, mud pies, he can get them for you, okay? Uh, but I was, I was making it, and I'm not a really good carpenter. I know a good carpenter, but I'm not a good carpenter. So being prepared, I was not, okay? I, I go out there and I say, well, okay, I need this. And I go and I tinker with it. And say, okay, well, I need this. So I got to go to the storage shed. And I go, all right, and I go back. I never was fully prepared to do what I was supposed to be doing. And I took a lot of time to, to make something that should have taken just a little bit of time. It took me a lot of time because I wasn't fully prepared. I wasn't fully prepared in my mind. I wasn't fully prepared with what tools I needed. And I really wasn't fully prepared to tell my uh, kids to stop messing with the saw and stop messing with this and that. I fully w wasn't fully prepared for that. But I've got to be prepared and we've got to be prepared to do God's work. And as I'm looking through Matthew chapter 2, I'm focusing in on verse 3, which Matthew chapter 2 verse 3 says, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And I wondered, how do we have a series that starts off talking about prepare, pre getting ready for God's work, and then I am in this verse that says, When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And the only word that stuck out to me was the word trouble. And I believe that if we're going to prepare to do God's work, we've got to prepare for trouble. Now, we've got to prepare for trouble, as in uh, persecution. We've got to prepare for trouble, as in fights. We've got to prepare for uh, trouble, as in whatever may come in our life that we uh, are not aware of, or that hit us all of a sudden, because those things come in. And if we're going to be prepared to do God's work, we've got to prepare for trouble. But I'm going to leave persecution, I'm going to leave fighting, I'm going to leave the, uh, the unknown, I'm going to leave that on the table, and I'm going to say we're going to prepare for trouble, and that trouble is trouble with the Messiah. And I've entitled today's message, Trouble with the Messiah. If you'll go to Matthew chapter 2, I want you to hold your place there, and then we're going to go later on to Philippians chapter 2, and I want you to hold your place there. So those are our two uh, main scripture passages today, Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 6, and Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. But I want to tell you today that God's presence shines a light on sin and why we need the Messiah. God's presence shines a light on sin and why we need the Messiah. Adam and Eve, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then, in the image of, of God, he created mankind. So there's Adam and Eve, and they ate the forbidden fruit because they bought into Satan's lie. In the very beginning, the first sin that came out was a lie from Satan, and they disobeyed God. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. So sin got into the world. Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and bought into Satan's lie. Cain and Abel, we see Cain killed Abel. Why did he kill him? Because his sacrifice wasn't recognized as highly as Abel's. He wanted to be recognized. We see the Tower of Babel in the Old Testament. People were building the tower on their own merit, and they were building it to God in order to reach him. We see Sodom and Gomorrah. We see people were giving in to the evil sensualities and doing what wasn't right in the sight of God. You see, they were doing that because they wanted to please themselves. We see Joseph's brothers and how they sold him into slavery because they didn't like the dream that he had. And that Joseph told him the dream that they would all bow down to him. They didn't like that. They were going to kill him. And one of the brothers said, don't kill him. Just sell him into slavery. I don't know what's worse. 
We see how that turned out, though, if you read the Bible. We see Pharaoh's suppression of the Israelites. We see Pharaoh wanted to have it his way. And he oppressed the people of God. We see that Israel, when they were freed, they made their own idols. They worshiped their own idols. We remember the story of the golden calf. How Moses comes down from the mountain, there's this golden calf, and all of a sudden they go, well, I don't know how that happened. We just threw our gold in there, and poof, the golden calf came out. We wanted to worship something. So they worshiped idols that they made with their own hands. We see King Saul in the Old Testament seeks to kill David because Saul doesn't want to give up his throne to anyone else. And Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his tens of thousands. Saul didn't like that song. We see that David eventually becomes king, and he gives in to the temptation of lust. He gives in to the temptation of uh, what he had seen with his eyes, and he takes Bathsheba to be his. And then he had to kill Uriah so that he could hide what he had done Because he gave in to what he wanted. We see that Israel split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, because of evil. Because of idolatry. We see that Nebuchadnezzar, as the Israelites were taken into captivity, we see that he makes the people bow down to a statue of himself. And he kills them if they don't. Because he wanted to be first. We see that Haman tries to execute all the Jewish people. And on and on we can go where evil has been done under God's watchful eye. Evil has been done. And this is just a small sample size of the evil that was committed in the Old Testament. And there are many more stories in the Bible. I would encourage you to pick it up. It's a good book. It's the most sold book in history. Okay? Pick it up. Read it. There's a lot of stories. There's a lot of stories of evil that was being committed in the Old Testament. And this evil was done so that people committing the evil could be first. They thought about themselves first. They didn't want anyone to be in front of them. They were not going to bow down to anyone. It was their agenda or else. From the beginning of creation, God has placed himself first. He is the creator and the only one worthy of worship. In Genesis 3, we remember that God said that the Messiah would come and he would crush the head of Satan and Satan would bruise the heel of the Messiah. And we know that that was just a foretelling of what would happen when Jesus, the Messiah, would be placed on the cross where Satan thought he had won and thought that he would kill the Messiah. And we see that the payment of our sin was paid by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we see that he didn't stay dead, but three days later he rose from the grave. He's alive and he has defeated death and the penalty of our sin, which is death. And we have the ability to see him one day because he gives us an eternal home when we submit our lives to him. So we see that in Genesis 3, God said that Messiah would come and that he would crush the head of Satan and Satan would bruise the heel of the Messiah. You see, God's plan is that he is first. God's plan is that he is king. We see the Messiah, who is Jesus. He is the only way for salvation. And if you ever hear of any other way than Jesus for salvation and eternal life, it's false. It's heresy. Get away from it. Don't listen to it. Okay? Uh, Just this week, someone had printed an article. I read it, and I was like, wow, that's heresy. But it's been given to a lot of people in the church. Not in this church, but the church. It's, it's put out, and it seems like it's good, but then you, when you get into deeper and you read it, it's, wow, this is heresy. We've got to understand this. 
But we see that the Messiah, Jesus, is the only way for salvation. There's no other way among mankind for salvation except through Jesus. If I left it there and I closed my Bible today, that would be enough. There's no other way. Some of you are trying to find another way to salvation. Some of you are trying to find another way to deal with your sin. And if it's left to us, we can't do anything about our sin. The only way that our sin can be forgiven is through the blood of Jesus Christ. So wake up. What are we doing? Do we come and sit and think that we're okay? That wasn't even in my notes. I'm sorry. But here's what I'm saying. The salvation only comes through Jesus, the Messiah. And it's been this way from the beginning. Now, all of this, God first, Messiah first, Jesus as king, salvation only through Jesus, Jesus is the king of kings, Jesus is the Lord of lords, all of this sounds easy from a distance. You see, we can hear it all and we can nod our heads in agreement. Yeah, sounds good, preacher, sounds good. But what happens when God comes down from heaven and makes his presence known in your life? What happens when God comes down from heaven? He comes down from what we see as a distance and he's standing face to face in front of us and he says, I am the Messiah. I am the King of Kings. You will bow down and worship me. You will confess me as Lord. What happens when we're faced with the decision to bow down and confess him as Lord? What happens when God takes on human flesh and walks among us? What happens when God intervenes in the plan of man? What happens when mankind rebels against the Messiah and his birth? What happens when we are faced with Jesus coming into our world and commanding us to follow him? What happens? You see, it may seem easy to believe in prophecy. It may seem easy to believe in what we've heard since we were children in the church. But what happens when the Messiah's presence shows up in your life? What will you do? Because now he's not some far off God. Now he has come to earth in the form of man, fully God, fully man. And he's come, died on the cross and said the only way for salvation is through Jesus. What happens when the Messiah's presence shows up in your life? What will you do? Well, today I want to show you, I want to show you how the world has trouble with the Messiah. I want to show you how the Messiah's presence shines a light on sin. And I want to show you how we must do something with the presence of the Messiah. You see, there is trouble with the Messiah. And if we're going to be prepared to do God's work, we've got to prepare for trouble with the Messiah. You're there in Matthew chapter 2. We're going to read Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Follow along as I read. And I want to focus in on verse 3. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born, what? King of the Jews. For we saw his star, his star, when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. And from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Would you bow your heads in prayer? God, I pray for all of us that as your word is spoken, that we would receive the truth and that we would look into our own hearts and we would see what you are doing and that we would respond to you in an accurate manner, and that we would do so appropriately for what your truth is doing. God, I pray for those in here who have never received you as Savior and Lord, never confessed you as that. And I pray that they will do that by the end of the service. I pray for all those who are in here, God, that have done that before, that if they're struggling with anything, God, that you would help them to trust in you. We trust your word. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 2 verse 3 says that when Herod heard that the wise men had come to worship the king of kings, he was troubled. And it says, and all of Jerusalem with him. And, And I've titled the message, The Trouble with the Messiah, because there is trouble with the Messiah. Herod had trouble with the Messiah. But what does this trouble with the Messiah cause people to do? What does it cause them to do when they have trouble with the Messiah? Well, look at Herod's trouble with the Messiah. Now, Herod, the root word there is hero from the word Herod. And we know that Herod thought of himself of as the king, as the Messiah. He actually placed himself on the throne to be the king of the Jews. Now, he was from Idumea, which is a lower province, and he was a descendant of people from there. And so he was of the Jewish descent, but he wasn't of the lineage of David, which is very important because we know that the Messiah would come from the lineage of David. We understand this, but that was not the lineage of King Herod. However, he tried to place himself as the Messiah, the king of the Jews. But he was troubled when he heard that a Messiah had come. He was troubled when the wise men came and said, where is the king? We have followed his star and we want to worship him. Herod had such a desire to hold the throne. He wanted to be the Messiah, and he actually named himself the king of the Jews. Now, anyone who thought that they could hold Herod's throne, and anyone who he thought was a challenger to his throne, they usually ended up murdered. He banished his first wife and child. He assassinated the high priest. He ordered the death of his second wife, Miriam. He ordered the execution of three of his sons because he feared that they would try to seek the throne. Caesar Augustus said of Herod, it is better to be Herod's pig than to be his son. Herod was greatly troubled with the news of this new king. And Herod responded to the news of the Messiah. You see, there's something that causes trouble. And Herod's trouble was with the Messiah. And usually when there's trouble, there's a response to the trouble. This is how Herod responded. He summoned, verse 4, the chief priests and scribes, and he asked them, where, where was the Christ to be born? In Bethlehem, he said. He, he summoned the wise men secretly. Hey, how, how old is this? This new king, this new Messiah that you're talking about. How old would this this boy be? So he summoned them secretly and asked them. And then he lied to them and he said, you know, when you go and find him and you follow the star, because he's a busy guy and he wants to stay in, in his kingdom and rule it. When you follow him, you let me know and I want to come and worship him too. Well, that didn't work. The wise men were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, and so they departed and didn't go back. In verse 16, then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. So not only did he try to see who this Messiah was, not only when was he born, where is he, not only did he lie and say he wanted to worship the Messiah, but he actually gave an order to kill male babies two years old or younger in that region. Can you imagine how evil one must be to kill anyone that could possibly take power from them, including killing babies. When you want to be first, you'll do anything to be first sometimes. No one was going to take the place of King Herod. Can you see what the presence of the Messiah 
does to people. It definitely magnified and shined a light on Herod's evil and his sin. You see, the presence of the Messiah shines a light on our sin and shows us why we need the Messiah. Herod had trouble with the Messiah, but there's others in Jerusalem that had trouble with the Messiah as well. We see the people's trouble with the Messiah. We see in in, in Jerusalem there was a power struggle. There There was King Herod. He was the face of Roman rule in that region. And he was making his claim. And there's a lot of historical things that we could go into about who he was trying to defeat and who he was trying to overcome and and how he's trying to make himself king. But we see that he wanted to be the face of Roman rule, and he was in that region. And he was making his claim to the throne and to all power. And then we see another part of the struggle in Jerusalem was the Jewish leaders, the scribes, the the priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the, the people that were the religious leaders of the day. They were trying to usurp power and they were trying to control the people. Yes, that happens. And then we see another part of the struggle is the Jewish people in Jerusalem were looking for the Messiah. They'd heard something about a Messiah and they were looking for him to come. They were looking for him to rule. They were looking for him to reign. They were looking for him to make everything right and take over the Roman government and rule for the people of God. They were looking for the Messiah to come and reign as their king. The struggle between these groups caused great controversy in Jerusalem. Who was going to be the ruler? Would it be Herod? He sure thought so, and he would do anything to attain it. Would it be the Jewish leaders? They were going to do whatever it took, even evil acts, to control the people. Would it be the Messiah? If the other two groups had anything to do with it, then the Messiah wouldn't have a chance. Yet, on the outside of Jerusalem, there were wise men who had heard prophecies, had studied the stars, who were seeking this Messiah that they didn't know a lot about, But they wanted to come and worship him. And I want to throw a side note in here. There are people outside of the church who would come inside the church to worship the Messiah and they could do so easier. But for the struggle of the power grabbing inside of churches today outsiders don't come into the church we've got to understand there are people outside that want to worship the Messiah they want to see what God can do for them they want to see a move of God but they don't know how and the place that they come is in the church for that to worship the Messiah Let not the church be seen to be a great struggle of controversy because of the trouble with the Messiah. You see, these wise men weren't caught up in the power grab. They were following the star which brought them great joy. Can you imagine a country and what it would be like if there were factions competing against one another for power? You'd have to think really hard to imagine that, wouldn't you? Could you imagine a world with factions competing for power? Maybe could you imagine a country? Could you imagine a state? Could you imagine a county? Could you imagine a city? Could you imagine a family? Could you imagine a husband and wife competing against one another? For the right to be first and to have their agenda done. And they would do anything to get that power. They would lie, steal, kill, and destroy people's lives 
to gain the power they so desperately desire in order to have their agenda. And all the while, the Messiah is waiting to be worshipped. All the while, the Messiah is waiting to rule and reign. All the while, there are those who are fighting through the trouble in their city to worship Jesus. You see, the Messiah's presence magnified the power grab, and it magnified the sin that comes with it. We've seen Herod's trouble with the Messiah. We've seen the people's trouble with the Messiah. Now let's turn our attention to another group and their trouble with the Messiah. And that's our trouble with the Messiah. You see, it's difficult for us to lay down our agenda for the Messiah, to serve the Messiah. It's difficult to lay down our agenda for anyone. We are so busy with our own agenda and what we can gain, that we will forget about the Messiah and we will forget about other people so that we can accomplish what we want to accomplish. Have you ever been to a four-way stop? All of us have been to a four-way stop. And people got there after you, but went through before you. That is the ultimate sin. I'm joking, it's not. It's just if you wanted to know, that's pretty bad on the list, okay? How many of you have been to a four-way stop and you got there first and somebody went through before you? Yeah? Come on now, some of you are lying already. How does it make you feel? You get words under your breath. You get hot under the collar. Your face turns red. Your wife slaps you. Because <laughs> she's trying to calm you down, but then she slaps you and you get redder in the face. <laughs> what about when you're standing in a long line, like the lines at Walmart the other night when I was going to get some yellow icing and, and some little red hearts to do a birthday cake for Jesus? <laughs> and I went on Christmas Eve, and I was wearing a boot, on my uh, medical boot on my foot because I tore a tendon in my bottom of my foot playing basketball with a pastor um, that will not be named (laughs) at 6 o'clock on Monday morning in the morning yeah that's right why were we doing that nothing good happens at that hour of the day unless you're doing a Bible study and praying what about when you're standing in a long line and someone comes and breaks in closer in the line in front of you oh that eats me up You ever been to Disney? Oh, Lord. And then somebody, they know everybody up here. They're all family, right? Oh, that's my cousin. I got to go stand with my cousin up here. And you're like, y'all don't even look alike. Ain't no way. And they ain't even talking to you. That ain't your cousin. It's happened to all of us. Somebody gets in front of us and we don't like it. Somebody goes before us and we don't like it. We have trouble with anyone else being first. And we live in a culture that puts so much emphasis on me that we forget about others. And we have trouble with the Messiah being first. And Satan would like nothing more for us to live as if everything was all about us. All about me. I told you to hold your place in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and we're going there now. So if you'll look in your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 2, when you get there, say, I'm there. If you're listening, say, I am. If you're asleep, please try not to snore still. I don't hear any snoring, but I, I noticed a couple of you checking your watches. That's right, I noticed who you were. All right? Just to let you know, pastors can see everybody from the pulpit. So when you check in your watch, forget about it, okay? (laughs) Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I love this passage. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same, what does it say? 
mind, having the same love, being full accordant of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you read that passage and you're not fired up about who Jesus is and what he's done for us and how he's the Messiah and he is the only one to be worshipped and how we should drop our agenda and focus on what God wants for us through Jesus Christ, then I don't know what's going to get it. But for us to lay down our agendas and serve the Messiah, we've, we must see how the Messiah served us. You see, we think that to be first, we've got to take everything in our own hands. We think that we must push others down to be first. But that's not what Jesus did. In Philippians 2, Paul says that in order to have encouragement, to order, in order to have comfort, in order to have any participation in the Spirit, and I take that to mean that in order to live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit... In order to have any affection, any sympathy, in order to have any completion of joy, we must be of the same mind. And what is that mind? The mind of Christ, the Messiah himself, who does nothing from selfish ambition. He does nothing from conceit. He counts others more significant than himself. And he looks to the interest of others and not just his own. You see, this is what Jesus did. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. There was no power grab. But he emptied himself. He took the form of a servant. And he humbled himself in obedience even to the point of death. Even death on death. A cross. If you want to be exalted, you must humble yourself. These are the words of Jesus. And after Paul writes, even death on a cross, he writes the word, therefore, God has exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. That name is the name of Jesus. You see, there is only one who could die on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And his name is Jesus. There's no other way. And because he is the only one who could die on the cross for our sin, God has bestowed on him the name that is above every name. It's even above your name. It's even above my name. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. And in becoming a servant, He showed us something. He showed us how we desire to be first. When we look at Jesus, we look at how, man, I really want to be first. But Jesus has humbled himself. He took the form of a servant. His presence on earth magnifies and shines a light on our sin 
And it shows us why we need him. I want you to, to listen in to this sentence. Because this sentence that I'm about to say, and you can even write it down, has changed my perspective this week and for the future and how I have trouble with the Messiah and how I need to repent. So here it is. Our desire to be first not only increases our sin, but it makes us strive toward a throne that is already taken. Our desire to be first not only increases our sin, but it makes us strive toward a throne that has already been taken. There is only one who is seated on the throne, and you are not it. And I am not it. But we have trouble with the Messiah when we try to place ourselves above him, when we strive to be on the throne. But we must know that that throne is already taken. Herod tried to be the Messiah and take power. The people in Jerusalem tried to take power. And we tried to take power. So what is our response? Philippians 2 tells us that because Jesus' name is above every other name, that every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So that means we've got to get off our throne and bow our knee before the one who already sits on the throne. Philippians 2 tells us that every tongue must confess that Jesus is Lord. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's someone in here clinging to your own throne, clinging to your own way of salvation. And you must this morning bow your knee before God, before Jesus Christ, and confess that he is Lord, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Alpha, that he is the Omega, that he is the beginning, that he is the end. And we do all this to the glory of the Father. You see, Herod was going to shed as much blood as possible to show that he was first. But Jesus, the true King of the Jews, shed his blood so that all who repent and believe in him would have a place in the kingdom of God. And I would rather repent of my sins and confess Jesus as Lord and worship him on his throne than to continue to strive for my own throne and miss out on eternal life altogether. We have trouble with the Messiah. From creation until today, people have fought, they've killed, they've lied, they've deceived, they've stolen, they've destroyed, and they've tried to make themselves first in all areas of life. But there is only one who is first, and his name is Jesus. The question Will you bow your knee to him today as your king and confess him as Lord? Stop placing yourself first and submit your life to him today. If we're going to be prepared to do God's work, we've got to be prepared for trouble. The trouble starts in our hearts. Where have you placed yourself first in your life because you have trouble letting God be first? Do you have trouble with the Messiah? Is there a struggle going on inside of you right now to submit for the first time for salvation to Jesus? If so, during our invitation, I want you to come down and we want to help 
pray with you, to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, to submit your life to Him. For those of you who have already done that, are you struggling with something that you want to be first in? Maybe it's in your marriage. And you'll do anything to keep control. Maybe it's at your job, and you'll do anything to keep control. Maybe it's in your own, just your opinions. And you think your opinions are right. And you have your agenda. And you've got to be first. Would you be like Jesus today and humble yourself? Even to the point of death. Where you say, I give it all for Jesus. Would you come today and trust in the grace, the marvelous grace of Jesus? Because he and he alone is seated on the throne. Let's pray.